Black Widow Spider lurks in the centre of its web. A scorpion blunders into the near invisible threads of the web, strung between the branch and the ground. The spider pounces. It's no easy kill for the Black Widow. The scorpion is armed with a poisonous sting and two pincers. The spider can't get close enough to bite and paralyse its prey, so it throws constraining threads and then rapidly retreats from the sting. After repeated forays, the Black Widow succeeds in immobilising it. But it doesn't eat it immediately. It is trussed and kept for later. The hamster has two pouches, one on each side of the mouth. When it is out foraging, it stores surplus food in them. On returning to its nest, it ejects the food and caches it for later consumption. Cows spend a large proportion of their time eating grass. Hummingbirds Distinctive and frenetic in flight, they are on the wing for a large part of the day, constantly visiting flowers from which they take their food. With precise control, they hover just in front of the flowers, probing the bloom with their long beaks, from the end of which the tongue searches for nectar, keeping them one step ahead in the energy game. From a gatherer to a hunter. The leopard, one of the giant cats of the African savanna, it advances on a tree. In fact, it is returning to its larder, where it has stored the carcass of an antelope killed some time before. Here, in this food store, safe from scavengers, it can take a meal. Animals display enormous variation in what they eat and in how and when they eat it but they have one thing in common. If food is available, they will eat when they are hungry. But whether they eat as they find or store their food, they are all controlling their food intake. How can we make sense of this? What are the regulatory mechanisms? For the leopard, food intake occurs at infrequent intervals when, if it can, it will gorge itself. Energy absorption from the gut starts shortly after feeding, rises and then declines exponentially over time. For the cow, intake is occurring most of the time, other than when it is chewing the cud. Absorption is more or less constant over time. What can we say about these differences between species? In all cases, food in the gut is broken down to supply energy to the body increasing the total energy available to the body. At the same time, the metabolic rate of the animal governs energy removal. The balance of these two, conventionally represented by this so-called summing junction, will, all else being equal, dictate when feeding occurs. For the cow, when it is awake, the balance between these elements is never quite high enough to allow it to stop feeding for any considerable period. For the leopard, the energy supplied during a single gorge feed is enough to allow it to refrain from feeding for some while. What we have is a simple systems model representing feeding in animals, where the information passing through a summing junction is evaluated and the result influences the decision to feed. 
This is a specific example of the general principle of feedback, a principle which is central to understanding regulation and control in animals. The ideas represented by this type of diagram were developed originally for other uses. This is a fixed bed steam engine. It operates by introducing steam into a piston, which pushes a shaft, which in turn moves a flywheel. The flywheel itself is intended to ensure the engine runs smoothly. The engine, in fact, is dedicated to pumping water. But its actions must be controlled. If steam were allowed to run into the piston without control, the engine might ultimately run so fast it would destroy itself, or so slow as to be useless. So a valve is used to allow steam to enter the piston cylinder, which drives the machine. But as a controlling device, this isn't sufficient. Both the steam pressure and the amount of water to be pumped might change unexpectedly. To maintain the speed of the engine at its intended level, something more is needed. First, you need to know how fast the machine is actually going. You need a device for monitoring speed. This device is known as a flyball governor. The flying balls are linked to the flywheel by a vertical shaft. As the speed increases, the heavy balls move out, away from the vertical shaft. The greater the speed of the engine, the further the balls move out. So the position of the balls provides a very sensitive measure of speed. Via mechanical linkages, the information on the engine's speed is fed back to the valve. If speed is below that required, the valve is automatically opened a bit more. If higher, it is automatically closed a little. What's happening is that actual speed is being compared with the intended speed. The control effort depends on the outcome of this comparison. In this way of looking at the system, you can see that engine speed depends upon flow of steam. But also, flow of steam depends upon engine speed. Steam is controlled and speed regulated. The feedback principle of this mechanical analogy is applicable in biological systems. It is implicated in many of the homeostatic control systems of animals. Obviously, there is no engineer to set these limits, but in other respects, there are close analogies with the steam engine. Take drinking. Drinking serves to maintain essential body fluid levels. Without water, these animals would die. But how do they know when they need to drink? They may have to walk many miles, taking a long time to get to a water hole. Do they set out before they are thirsty or when they are thirsty? With something as important as this, it can't be hit and miss. Systems concepts can go some way to explain this. The animal that we have the most clear understanding of, because it has been studied extensively in laboratory conditions, is the rat. The regulation of body water level is one of the most important physiological functions, especially for mammals. Something like 69% of the rat's body weight is water, and there is little tolerance for departures from this value. Obviously, all the water doesn't simply sit at one place in the animal. It is dispersed throughout the body and divides into two compartments. Cellular, that is within the cells, and extracellular, in the gaps between cells, and the water of the blood. On a day-to-day -day basis, without undergoing exercise or subject to any constraint, the rat experiences steady water loss, mainly through urination. But losses also come from evaporation from the lungs, feces, and from spreading saliva on its fur in grooming. 
At some point, the rat moves to correct this accumulating water deficit by taking a drink. But what prompts it? Loss of body water promotes the motivation to drink. But what exactly is the mechanism involved? The animal is obviously taking some measure of body water, monitoring how much it is deviating from the optimal 69%. It can't literally measure a volume of water in the way that a scientist would. What happens is that a measure of a sample of body water is taken. This is done in two places. The first is in the brain, where the state of dehydration of some cells in the hypothalamus is monitored. The second arises from the state of stretch of a major vein close to the heart. Loss of water from the blood reduces its volume, which causes constriction of this vessel. As a result of the information received from either of these two sources, the animal is motivated to drink. In systems terms, we can represent it like this. There are two stimuli, the extracellular and the cellular. An input from either of these stimuli is sufficient to arouse the motivation to drink. After the rat starts drinking, it is then motivated to continue. Additional stimulation is given by the combination of the mechanics of licking and the detection of water passing over the tongue. This additional stimulation is an example of positive feedback where the act of drinking increases its own motivation, causing the rat to continue. However, it won't drink indefinitely, so how does the rat know when it has drunk enough? Most of the water is still in the stomach, nowhere near either the cellular or extracellular sensors. It can't be due to them. The system appears to perform a rather clever trick. The feedback loop that initially provides positive feedback switches to provide negative feedback after a period of drinking. This now plays an inhibitory role. In addition, the bulk of fluid in the stomach serves to inhibit further drinking. So we can begin to piece together, in systems terms, the logic of the processes underlying the maintenance of body fluid levels in the rat. But there's another aspect to this regulatory system. As we've seen, during a period of water deprivation, the animal is motivated to seek water, a behavioural or so-called extrinsic control. But it also takes steps to reduce the loss of water by inhibiting the production of urine. This is facilitated by a hormone, a so-called intrinsic control. The same process that gave rise to motivation, part of the extrinsic control, also determines the secretion of a hormone called antidiuretic hormone, or ADH for short. This hormone is secreted from the pituitary gland at the base of the brain and acts on the kidney to minimize urine losses, reducing overall fluid loss from the body. This means that the detection mechanism is on the boundary between and serves functions within two very different biological domains of the animal, the intrinsic physiological and the behavioural. This is not uncommon in regulatory systems, although the importance of extrinsic and intrinsic responses differs between species. The desert, where the temperature is higher than that at which enzymes start to malfunction. Among others, two groups of animals live here. The first are reptiles, well adapted for life in a hot environment. In many species, relatively wide extremes of temperature are experienced, a broad zone of temperature tolerance. Some rather ingenious mechanisms have evolved in the service of temperature regulation. Removing their feet from the scorching sand, they can remain in the sun until body temperature rises so much that even they are forced to retreat, to bury themselves down in the cooler layers. 
man also spends time in the desert. Like the lizard, he is able to tolerate the hot air temperature, but also like the lizard, there comes a point when he must move to a cooler environment, taking cover in whatever shade is available. Both man and the lizard are displaying extrinsic, or in other words, behavioral control over body temperature. Although they vary enormously in so many parameters of their temperature regulation systems, this control mechanism is common to both. For both man and lizard, the rate at which their bodies heat up and retain heat determines body temperature. This temperature is being monitored at a number of sites in the body. The information on an increased body temperature promotes an action, in both cases a behavioural one, of finding shade, a cooler place which will relieve temperature stress. Like the motivation to drink, this control action is extrinsic. We can see in detail these behavioural controls used by lizards in a situation that mimics the natural habitat. This device is called a shuttle box. It's simply a box with two temperature regimes. Beneath the floor on one side, hot water is circulating, raising the temperature to an uncomfortably high level. On the other side, the circulating water is at a very low temperature. The lizard in the box, a desert iguana, can move freely between the two areas while its internal temperature is being monitored by the experimenter. As the lizard starts to heat up, it gapes, thus cooling itself by evaporative loss of water from mouth and lungs. But the main control device this species uses is shuttling, taking heat from the environment when it needs it and dumping it when it becomes too hot. It achieves this by moving backwards and forwards between the two areas, an example of behavioural control over temperature. Compare this with humans. The control actions are best seen in a completely artificial setting. In this case, under the stress of a Turkish bath. This is an environment where he deliberately puts himself for recreational reasons, rather than those of temperature regulation. But whatever his reasons, the physiological response is the same. The first and most obvious sign is sweating. Evaporative loss from the surface of the skin has a cooling effect, as do panting and gaping. Spreading the limbs maximizes the surface area available for evaporative loss. In addition, blood vessels dilate and heartbeat rises in an attempt to bring hot blood from the core of the body to the surface. The skin is suffused pink. All of these controls mean that the man can maintain a near normal body temperature in an extremely hot environment. The stone slab which he is sitting on is at a far higher temperature than his own body. There comes a time when even a voluntary subject of temperature stress must seek relief, and the behavioural response is similar to that of the lizard, to shuttle off to a cooler area. The model representing temperature regulation can now be amended to include intrinsic or autonomic control. It's important to note that this diagram doesn't help quantify the contributions made by intrinsic or extrinsic controls. It's equally applicable to lizards and humans. Whatever the species differences may be, a crucial feature of such a system is some means of detecting temperature. In fact, the means of monitoring temperature is also common between the species. Animals have both core and peripheral monitors of body temperature. Neurons, whose rate of firing depends upon temperature, provide a measure of body temperature. Some of these are so-called warm neurons, whose firing rate increases as body temperature rises. 
Others are cold neurons, whose rate of firing decreases with increases in body temperature. Control effort depends upon the difference in activity level of these two neurons. At optimum body temperature, the two signals cancel, and there is neither a cooling nor warming effort. If body temperature falls, then the signal from the cold neurons dominates and there is a heating action. If body temperature rises, then the signal from the warm neurons dominates and there is a cooling action. So much for physiology and behaviour, both intrinsic and extrinsic controls collaborating in the interests of regulation. But is that all? What about the subjective feelings associated with control actions such as these? Perhaps surprisingly, we can also deal with these in a scientific way. This work requires the cooperation of a patient and willing volunteer. First a thermometer monitoring body temperature is inserted. Then she gets into a bath of water where her body temperature can be disturbed from its norm by changing the temperature of the bath. This is achieved by heating or cooling the bath water. Next, she places her hand in a black glove outside the bath. To one side of the bath is a setup which can either cool or heat an independent water supply. This water is pumped to the inside of the black glove. The skin of the hand only is then stimulated by the water, which is at a temperature controlled by the experimenter. The subject is then asked to report on how the temperature stimulus on the hand feels. The same experiment is conducted on the same volunteer a number of times over a range of temperatures. The results confirm that subjective feelings depend upon internal physiological state. When the subject's body temperature is low, the reaction to the stimulus on the arm is positive with increases in glove water temperature. Conversely, when the subject's body temperature is high, warm stimuli are felt to be disagreeable and cold stimuli agreeable. So systems theory can help us to deal with the whole spectrum of reactions in biological systems. These range from understanding the subjective feelings of temperature stimuli, to the control systems for consuming the appropriate amount of water, control over kidney function, and the control of feeding. The importance of understanding these systems in terms of homeostasis is vital.